Uh, hello. Good evening, dear guests. Welcome to today's presentation by the Turkish Pediatric Radiology Society. I will be your introductor for the day. And it's April Fool's Day. You all got pranked. Anyways, like, here's your real introductor. Uh, love the person who pranked you. Merhabalar. Uh, good evening, everyone. So we wanted to make a little joke because today is April Fool's Day and we are the Turkish Pediatric Radiology Society. And we happen to have the volunteer performer for that. So thank you. And then uh, today's lecture uh, will be, uh, today our guest will be Dr. Felis Darko from uh, Great Ormond Hospital in London. And our moderator is Dr. Ali Kılmaz uh, from McMaster University. And he'll, uh, Dr. Darko will be presenting us his cases. And before that, Dr. Ali Kılmaz will make a short introduction. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce one of my best friends, Felice Darko. As a presenter today, he is an excellent uh, neuroradiologist, and we've been friends since the fellowship at SickKids together. In 2015, he completed the fellowship. We were, we were together. He is uh, currently one of the teachers in uh, ENSPR, in one of the uh, in the in ENSPR courses, and also he is uh, he is a editorial member in the Neuroradiology Journal. He is very active. He has excellent lectures. I follow his YouTube channel. I listen to his lectures. He is really good. Welcome, Felice. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, let's start sharing. Yeah, but please. You would comment the first picture because you put the picture on. Yes, so OK. So uh, yeah. other than his, uh, his professional career, uh, Felice is a typical Italian. He is a really good cook. He has nice cooking skills and he can cook the best pasta in the world for you. That's how we met years ago. And you can see that also when we were uh, fellows, we used to call him Darkovich at that time because he was very brilliant and Barkovich was our uh, like uh, we were we were really inspired by Dr. Barkovich, so we used to call him Darkovich. And after years, last year we made a meeting, and he actually gave a lecture after Dr. Barkovich. So he's I, I think I I'm I can call him the second Darkovich <laughs> today as a joke. We fulfilled our dreams. Yeah, so the dreams came true, right? George yeah. Taylor, Darkovich, <laughs> Markovich. <laughs> it was good. So, so please uh, go ahead and uh, start your presentation, and I will be helping you for the uh, for the polls, and I will be taking the questions and ask ask you the questions. So, if anyone wants to ask a question in the audience, please type in the Q Q and A box, so I we, I can just directly ask to Dr. Darko. And uh, we, we should do this case by case. We don't have to wait for the end of the lecture. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here uh, with you. And uh, uh, this is really a lecture with a lot of cases of neck masses in children that can be quite tricky. I love head and neck in children, a bit neglected area. Uh, and this is structure of the talk. It's case-based uh, presentation. Uh, there will be cases, teaching point, radiological differential. And as Ali uh, said, uh, you will have several pools. Just we have a lot of cases. We don't need to reach the end of the lecture if we don't have time, but please just try to answer the pool as fast as you can so we get to see uh, as many cases as possible. Uh, so let's start with the, this warm up case. I like very much to show in my neuro oncology and head and neck talks because it's really, really interesting. This is a 10 weeks old girl born with this. Uh, lesion in the periorbital uh, region was obvious, 
But the interesting thing of this case is that as radiologists, we can really connect the dot and we can really understand how you see something in the neck, something somewhere else. And these things taken in isolation are not really a diagnostic, but together we can sometimes reach a very complex diagnosis. So let's start with the head and neck uh, lesion. You see here, the, the coronal uh, the T2 stir that I showed you. And of course, when you do head and neck masses, please all the time get rid of the fat in T2 and in T1 post. In T1 pre, you need the fat as a passive contrast media around the lesion. So that's the basic of uh, um, the, the, the technical approach to head and neck. So T2 with fat saturation, so stir or spear and uh, and uh, t1 normal t1 pre but then t1 post with um, a fat saturation and also so we see the lesion also look at the diffusion very nasty aggressive lesion there is um, um, restriction of the diffusion plus nodal enlargement this is not reactive even in a neonate but then we keep looking and we have another lesion and look, those of you who are uh, neuroradiologists, adult neuroradiologists, this lesion does not enhance. It's very, very unusual for a mass in the adult brain to the not enhance, but still, uh, again, diffusion restriction, intermediate uh, T2 signal. So this is the combination of finding intracranial neck congenital because the, 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 the child was born with that. So and now you can read the pool, Ali. Yes. So. Uh, what is your diagnosis? A, metastatic neuroblastoma, B, RMSPAX7 fusion with brain and nodal metastases, and C, multiple tumors from, uh, let, let me actually share this with you so you can vote in the meantime. So multiple tumors of SMARCB1 mutation, D is atypical tuberculosis in hypogammaglobulinemia. Right, 10 seconds, guys. Oh, it, it was difficult to read this, Felicia. <laughs> yeah, anyway, RMS is rhabdomyosarcoma for those of you who are not familiar with the acronym oh, yeah. just for space. And SMARC B1, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a mutation, PAX7, another mutation. You can start uh, uh, both. Okay, so ending the poll now. Share okay. results. So most people said B. And yeah, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. So that's very, very good. I mean, half of you um, didn't get it right, but this is, of course, a complex diagnosis. But why? What I wanted to show is a few couple of teaching points. This in the in the brain was an ATRT. Okay, a typical teratorhabdoid tumor. It's a, one of the three main embryonal tumor in the brain. And there is something in the head and neck, which is soft tissue, uh, rhabdoid tumor, uh, and both are due to smart B1 mutation. Why is so important? Because if we see an aggressive mass in the orbits, it's just an aggressive mass in the orbits, they need the biopsy. If we see something in the brain showing diffusion restriction, we think embryonal, but we cannot go further than that. This combination allow us to do histological and genetic diagnosis, just looking at the images. And this is just one of these few examples. But of course, this is very rare. But what I want to stress is that uh, every embryonal tumor in children show striking diffusion restriction, even though some of them do not enhance, like some of the ATRT do not enhance, some of the so-called ETMR, which is embryonal tumor with multi-layer rosette, do not show enhancement. And also some subgroup of medulloblastoma like the type four do not show enhancement. So completely different from the adult world. Uh, and um, um, and, and uh, of course, embryonal tumor are in young children. So in your differential diagnosis of the mass in the children, use the age as a um, very important uh, um, bullet in, in your gun, okay? Um, um, this is another question that Ali put. Uh, so uh, yeah, please, Ali. OK, so let me find the question. So uh, which one is true about Italy? Italy has a free wine fountain. B, Italy has most UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world. C, Italy is the fifth most visited country in the world after Turkey. D, Italians consume 14 billion espressos each year. E, all of the above. 
because the first question was really difficult. That's why I wanted to put an easy question. <laughs> and of we... course, guys, oh, this is, uh, you know, first of April, but if you have any doubt about what we are discussing with Dali, just, just type it in and, and, and we'll try to, uh, to explore uh, any uh, question or element of differential diagnosis and so on. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. So... I'm the one consuming most espresso, I mean, good percentage of that. Oh, you see. So, 90%. yeah, all of the above, are they true? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, there is a free wine fountain that I never visit, and this is why I'm still able to do this presentation. Uh, Italy <laughs> has a lot of um, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, and for some reason, it's only the fifth uh, um, uh, most visited country, but very close to Turkey. And yeah, I, I myself, I consume a lot of espressos. Um, I never use this close to the espresso. This is close to wine normally, this cantuccino, this biscuit, but still. All right, so let's come back to the radiology. And uh, this is a one-year-old baby girl with, the, with this mass, okay? So the first thing you think as a radiologist is, um, okay, this is a young, young, is an infant, and how the mass look like, how the lesion, what we are looking looks like, what are the radiological characteristics. But first of that, uh, first of all, you need to make sure your technique is right. So my suggestion is that every time you see a mass, you must give contrast because contrast helps you a lot in the differential diagnosis. And in this case, we gave contrast and look how homogeneous is the contrast. Uh, enhancement. However, the mass is not completely homogeneous. There are these areas of T2 I point density. So remember T2 I point density in the mass. So the characteristic of the mass, how we will describe in the report, but these are useful not only for description, but you know to reach the diagnosis are well defined. Look at the ADC here, free diffusion. This is not aggressive as the other one I showed you. Homogeneous is intense enhancement, very useful for the differential diagnosis. Don't be scared of getting a um, contrast. And these things are internal flow void because are serpiginous areas of hypo intensity. That's a very easy case, very common mass. So tell me, what is the diagnosis? So, uh, A, infantile hemangioma, B, venous malformation, C, venal lymphatic malformation, D, AVM. And while you vote, these are the four main uh, um, uh, pathologies that we found in the infant. And, uh, you know, apart from uh, abdomiosarcoma, uh, these are among the most common. So once you, you, uh, you, you, you will, uh, I will stress uh, the element of differential diagnosis between them, you have done most of the job, apart from very, very rare cases, you would not be uh, finding, you, you would not be uh, really uh, fooled by very strange stuff, uh, unless you are very unlucky, once you know the element of radiological differential diagnosis between these four. Okay, so most people voted for infantile hemangioma, 73%. Yeah, so the only other difference of 20% is venal lymphatic malformation. I will show you what are the, again, the elements of differential diagnosis. This was an infantile hemangioma. So remember, the key feature is, first of all, this is a benign mass. And these are radiological features. There are clinical features I will show you in a bit. But the enhancement is homogeneous because this is a neoplasm. It's a vascular neoplasm. It's not a vascular malformation. So this is a neoplasm homogeneous enhancement, apart from all these internal vessels that are the radiological hallmarks of the infantile hemangioma. Although you can have some pitfalls. There are no calcification. And remember, most of the infantile uh, of the hemangiomas, so the so-called infantile hemangioma, because then we have the congenital hemangioma, but most of them are infantile hemangioma and they go toward uh, a triphasic evolution with final involuting phase of fatty replacement. So, ask your clinician how the lesion is behaving. It's completely different from the venous and venal lymphatic malformation. The first differential diagnosis is another T2 bright mass. So this is a mass, you always see the mass, you should give contrast. Uh, and again, we have some areas of hypointensity here and maybe some stripes here, okay? So again, we have the area of hypointensity. In this case, we were very lucky because we had also the, um, um, the uh, ultrasound with the shadowing. So now I will ask you, what is this thing inside? So A, flow void, B, 
calcium, phlebolite, C, blood, D, nidus, AVM. So these are all things that can be hypointense in T2, you know, phloboids, and nidus of vessel in the AVM, a clot of blood, and uh, calcium. So, but in, in this context, and also remember where is the lesion? This is in the masticator space. This lesion like masticator space a lot. This lesion is centered in the masseter, but uh, you know, it is, is basically there. And almost all of you got it right. Most of you probably also because they know the ultrasound and this is typical of calcium. But what is important that as the um, uh, flowboid, internal flowboid are the typical uh, radiological hallmarks of the hemangioma. The flebolites, although not always present, are the typical radiological hallmark of the venous malformation. That is your first diagnosis. And the important thing is that because this is a malformation, right? It's not a tumor. The um, enhancement is variable and increases over time and is patchy and heterogeneous. So if you read the book and then, you know, every one of us, we study something in the book and then in the uh, in the practical clinical daily experience, we stress other things that are not very maybe stressed or focused on in, 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 the, in the literature. But what I learned is that I don't trust too much this T2 signal that is supposed to be very, very bright in venous malformation. I trust the presence of febrilate, uh, absence of flow void and variable enhancement. There can be some stripes, there can be fibrous tissue, but that's not like serpiginous uh, you know, flow void like in the hemangioma. Look at this other scan. And this is the importance of the clinical appearance. We just had these two sequence again, T2 corona, fat saturated, and T1, remember, pre-contrast, you need the fat around, so you don't fat saturate the pre-T1 um, in the other neck. Um, so this is a female right cheek vascular malformation. This is all we got. What are these things? Our vessel, or are um, uh, stripes of, of, uh, of uh, fibrosis with a few flebolites. Uh, it's a bit difficult, right? Maybe flebolites or maybe vessels. But what you remember that you can pick the phone and call your clinician. This was a mass, it was flesh core bluish uh, that expanded after Valsava maneuver and could be flattened. So this is a mass that changed with venous pressure. This is critical because, of course, this is typical of what? Oh. Infantile mangioma, venous malformation, venous lymphatic malformation, or AVM. Okay, I think most people will get it. So I'm ending the poll here, share yeah. the results. So most people said venous, but what about venous lymphatic? How yeah, do we differentiate? Right. Yeah, that's very important. So the, the, I, I, I will show you a paper that you must download really uh, from Deborah Schatkes uh, de describing the, the difference between, uh, between malformation and tumor, vascular tumor. But the important thing you need to remember is that, uh, so this uh, um, was a, a venous malformation. The venous, so the, the malformation, uh, vascular malformation of the head and neck region can be simple or, or uh, um, uh, complex. Um, so if they are complex, they can have um, venous element and lymphatic element, for instance. But the important is that the lymphatic malformation is full of cyst and have fluid fluid level with the vascular element giving you some contrast or so patchy areas of contrast. But if you say something that looks like a venous malformation that is mainly solid, you call it venous malformation. If you see something that looks like a lymphatic malformation but has some contrast, and again, you read the book and the book say venous, uh, so sorry, lymphatic malformation, no contrast, but you can have some venous leak that enhances. So in this case, you can look called venous lymphatic. The reality is that in this case, and I will show you cases where it, it matters the differential, in this case, venous malformation or venous lymphatic doesn't change because they, they do sclerotherapy and they are fine. So the management is very, very similar. But remember, venous lymphatic malformation are mainly lymphatic with some veins, according to my experience. Look at this other. Same location, post-contrast, fat-saturated images. Look at the enhancement here. Look at the difference with the hemangioma. So the, my pearl is I trust the patchy and increasing over time enhancement more than the T2 signal to differentiate hemangioma from venous malformation. If you read the book, they say very, very bright in T2 venous malformation, a bit less bright in T2 hemangioma, but really, really, you need to 
kind of um, uh, use the contest more. And also ask your clinician what the lesion look like. This is how the lesion look like, is bluish. And um, this is how the hemangioma look like. So venous malformation, hemangioma. Look at the trajectory of the hemangioma, increases and then fatty replacement. And if you look at the, um, uh, this is a beautiful book, just the differential diagnosis in pediatric dermatologies. Look at this hemangioma increases over time and then disappear. The venous malformation are always present at birth while most of the hemangioma, they need a bit to, to develop. Uh, and uh, uh, although there are congenital hemangiomas, but the infantile hemangioma regresses, the venous malformation goes worse and worse, need to be treated. So this differential diagnosis is very important. The differential diagnosis between venous malformation, venous lymphatic malformation, not really important. Look at this other case. So it came with the reddish color here, sometimes swelling. Uh, we had the genetic diagnosis. So they we knew what we were dealing with, but that's very complex case. Look at this area of announcement here. And look at the top. There are prominent vessels. So I show you before, prominent vessel is a characteristic of the hemangioma. But of course, when it comes to prominent vessel, you need co to consider also AVM. In this case, the TOF was not enough to show the nidus. So is these micro AVMs that is too small to see the nidus or these are flow voids that show some enhancement? Um, uh, sorry, there is a poll that started. Yeah, oh, yeah. am I too early? <laughs> Wrong. Uh, what is the arrow pointing yeah. at? Yeah. So, okay, so, or, you know, this is, uh, uh, let's say the flow void uh, that the vessel that is characterizing the hemangioma. So uh, I also pu put something else. So um, tumoral cells with, the, uh, with arterial feeders, uh, flebolites, blood, or an idus or AVM. What's the difference? Of course, tumoral cell meaning hemangioma. So in, in this case, you say, you say an idus or AVM, but remember, why you say that? So the problem is that these were mi micro AVMs, and we knew that because we had the, the genetic diagnosis that was a RASA1 mutation that is associated with AVM. And we had this prominent maxillary artery and arterial artery, and then we did an angiography, and we demonstrated that at that level there were some niduses. But we knew that this was RASA1 mutation, and see also the prominent of the soft tissue in the, 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 the left side of the face. So we knew already that this had to be an AVM. But my point for the differential diagnosis, and I will show you several examples now, uh, is that prominent vessels are characteristic of AVM and hemangioma. The difference is that the hemangioma has a mass. The AVM, look at that, where is the mass? This is just a bit of, uh, of a contrast. There is no mass whatsoever. And this is why you need to, how you need to work out your differential. In this is another case where the differential is critical. Why? Because AVM goes worse and worse, a very difficult aesthetic problem for the child. They can lose the eyes it's close to the orbital region and so on. And hemangioma can be close to the orbital region, regresses as the one I showed you before, and it's not a problem. So first differential diagnosis, the second differential diagnosis is AVM. We know what is an arteriovenous malformation, but remember, the only very important thing is that you see the nidus, but you can uh, sometimes in the micro AVM, uh, you cannot see the nidus clearly, but there, was, there will be no mass. Another thing, the AVM can be very aggressive, can erode the bone, but again, there will be no mass. And this will help you in differentiating from aggressive masses like the rhabdomyosarcoma. So mass and flow void, hemangioma, mass and flebolite, venous malformation, mass uh, with, with a lot of cystic component, a bit of patch enhancement, venous lymphatic malformation, no mass, a lot of vessel, AVM, right? Look at this other case. This case is full of, uh, uh, of uh, vessels and uh, uh, also enlarged uh, uh, veins. And we did also an MRI that they can show the, 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 um, uh, that some of these vessels have uh, arterial, um, uh, uh, arterial flow, okay? Now, what is the diagnosis in this case? So remember what I told you uh, and, and uh, try to do, um, 
to work out the differential. I don't know if you have any comment while people are voting, Ali. Oh, no, I, I think it looks good. I, it's very important that for the AVM, I see many times people are uh, confused if this, that's an Imagium or AVM. The, the key finding is there is no mass in AVM. So that's really important, yes. Okay, so for this case, that's interesting because most people said Himangioma, but there, there are also people calling this an AVM. I cannot see the- Oh, sorry, the sorry, yeah. okay. Okay, okay. That's sure. oh, very good. So this is actually 30, 30, 30. So 40% uh, say Himangioma, 25 venolymphatic malformation, but I told you venolymphatic malformation is full of cystic areas and 35% say um, mm. AVM. Okay, this is very nasty looking full of vessel, but this is a mass guy. You know, that's a mass. When you see a mass, first of all, you call the clinician because if you have a mass, they will have a clinical appearance that can help you a lot. Second of all, you, uh, you look at this vessel, you know, all this vessel, if there was a shunt, should have given you something in the, in the sinus, there was no shunt whatsoever. But your point is, is that a mass? Yes, full of vessel, we don't care. Okay, so this was a rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma on the forehead. So remember, 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 mass and flow void hemangioma. If you have any doubt, you call the clinician. No mass, a lot of vessel, think AVM. Look at this case, one-year-old maid, right proptosis here. Okay, so look at this. Again, we have a problem with the, 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 the proptosis, so there is an aesthetical problem, something you know creating a problem in the eye with a lot of vessel. This is the post contrast, this is the T2, then they fat saturated T2. For some reason, they fat saturated also the T1, but still in this case, you can see better the vessel in the fat saturated T1. So now I have a look at this image like for five seconds, very, very important. I want to thank the family uh, they gave me this case um, uh, because I think that that's very, very a uh, nice case. So think about what we speak with the uh, Ali and tell me again, same, same uh, uh, differential, hemangioma, venous malformation, venous lymphatic malformation on ABM. Okay, people are voting. Person. Okay, stopping the poll now, share the results. So most people said ABM. Good, okay, so in this case, that's very, very good that you say ABM because again, where is the mass? Where is the enhancement? There is mass effect because of the prominence of the vessel, uh, probably the, the, the blood uh, and the, the venous drainage is uh, um, here of the superior ophthalmic vein is impaired. So we have this uh, uh, proptosis, but where is the mass? There is no mass, guy, uh, guys, so this is, too many vessels, no mass, worsening over time is an AVM. This is a red flag because they thought that this was an hemangioma. They biopsy the, the, the eye and they found only, only fat. They thought that they got the biopsy wrong. They treated with propanolol. The child was worse and worse. And before they figure out that was an ABM, there were a lot of problem in terms of um, aesthetics of, of, of the face. They need to go in another center, embolites, it was terrible. So uh, this become a medical legal case. You need to be aware, first give contrast. And second, you need to be aware that uh, if there is no mass, at least think, uh, say, listen, this is very small. I see some vessel, but think of AVM in the differential, speak with the newer interventions, All right? Very important. Look at this other case. That's another situation when there are a lot of vessel. The problem is that whatever is going on here is centered in the parotid that is per se a mass. So now we have a problem. And if we do MRA, we see again prominent vessel, uh, arterial vessel also in the MRA. So again, you have a conundrum here. You have a lot of vessels and you need to decide whether or not there is a mass or not, or this is just a parotid uh, and, and this is an AVM within the parotid. The lesion look like that. Now let's go with the, uh, so remember what I showed you before, remember what I described also without showing you. So this is what uh, what it was. What do you think about that? 
it's an hemangioma. It's a venom malformation, venom lymphatic malformation, or AVF. And if you think I'm going too fast because I try to reach the end of the talk, but just just chat or or text Ali, uh, and and I will just slow down. It's okay. Okay, everyone say almost everyone say hemangioma. Very 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 good. Why? Because if we come back here, you see the parotid stops here. This is all mass. You see the mass, you see the vessel, and it looks like an hemangioma. Think about hemangioma, all right? Non idus, typical appearance here. Um, there is a mass and responding to problem. So, this non idus actually was the fellow I changed this. This is mass, not non idus. Sorry about that. This is an old presentation, old slide, but uh, remember there is actually mass. So, this is a, a, a slide from Deborah Schatkes. Um, she works in the US. She's an expert in Venus, in um, uh, vascular malformation. So, there are things that enhance and things that do not enhance. The things that enhance are masses and are hemangioma and venous malformation. Flebolites, venous malformation, you can see the sigla in T2, although I don't trust more, uh, too much. Dynamic patchy enhancement. Enhancement with uh, triphasic growth and this internal vessel, intermediate sigla in T2, again a mass, this is a mangioma. Different appearance, different evolution, clinical evolution over time. Now, without mass, but with a lot of vessels is an AVM. Remember, AVM can be aggressive. So when you see bony erosion, you need to think of an AVM. Lymphatic malformation can be macro microcystic. I will show you some example, but remember the radiological mark. So what you focus your attention to among all the things we see, um, in this case, it's fluid fluid level because of the uh, um, internal bleeding. So here would be the flow voids, here will be the flavolites, here will be flow voids, no mass, here fluid fluid level. And this is the paper I want to uh, suggest. It's a very short paper, very well written um, uh, by Deborah Schatkes uh, and explain you the, malform the combined malformation, for instance, uh, uh, venolymphatic um, uh, malformation. So venous malformation plus lymphatic malformation and also syndromic association. Now look at this uh, uh, case uh, with a lot of bony erosion. So now we have a, a mass, again, centered in the masticator space, like the venous malformation I showed you before. There is some bony erosion, and this is the appearance on DWI, this is the appearance on PET. Again, there are areas of T2 high point intensity uh, within. Now you need to decide what are they, the, these areas and how we interpret that. That's very, very easy for you. So. Um, what is this? Hemangioma, rhabdomyosarcoma, venous lymphatic malformation, or AVM with bony erosion. Okay, 74 said rhabdomyosarcoma. Some of you say venous lymphatic malformation, 23%. Okay, so this is a diagnosis you need to get right. So it's very important that you understand that this is a rhabdomyosarcoma. Why? Let me come back, guys. So this is a mass, so cannot be an AVM. These areas are necrosis. They do not look like flebolites, but they may be flebolites, but remember that for sure they are not vessels. But remember, venous malformation, venous lymphatic malformation can be transpatial, but they are not aggressive. They can also be in the bone, but you, don't, you will not have this erosion. You will not have diffusion restriction, and for sure, this is an aggressive um, uh, uh, pet profile. So, if you see a mass aggressive in children, especially if it's centered in the masticator space, think rhabdomyosarcoma. They can be everywhere, but again, as venous malformation, they have predilection in the masticator space. The difference being that they are very aggressive in their behavior. All right. Um, so when you see something like that, uh, call rhabdomyosarcoma until otherwise proven. On top of that, you have the age that helps you because as I told you before, they are born with venom, venous malformation. They have this bluish color, change with Valsalva, rhabdomyosarcoma, they develop over time. And rem remember, bony erosion, aggressive invasion of surrounding soft tissue and areas of necrosis. Diffusion restriction has been reported, uh, although they are intermediate, they are not as much as the embryonal tumor, but for sure, much more 
than uh, the, um, uh, the venous malformation. So aggressiveness, mass, child, rhabdomyosarcoma is your first differential. Now, these were solid mass. Let's go to the cystic mass. Now, one thing I want you to remember is that when it comes to cystic mass, they look all the same, okay? They are full of fluid and do not enhance a part a bit of rim here. So for cystic mass, everything is about location, location, location. So when it comes to cystic mass, you think about location. So look at this mass, where it is, and how you would describe. So I described already, this is uh, fluid, and where it is, well, is in the midline, very close to the strap muscles. Okay, so what is that? What do you think it is? It's very easy. If someone wants to write, uh, in the, ah, we don't have the chat though. Um, yeah. Or we do what have we do have the chat or the. Oh, I think way. only yeah. Q and A. Anyway, no, both. Uh, but I, I didn't realize there was the pool. So what is that? First branchial cleft cyst yeah. or anomaly, second. Okay, everyone say tyroglossal duct cyst. Very well, because it's a cyst and the cysts look all the same and, are, and is in the midline. Now, I think the pool we can, uh, we shall re repeat the same pool afterwards. Look at this other case. It looks exactly the same, but it's slightly in different position. Note the relationship again with the strap muscle, but this is uh, not on the midline as before. This is probably a, 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 a partial voluming effect. Uh, we call it non-enhancing uh, or just with a rim enhancement, sometimes a bit prominent. Remember that every cyst can be infected or can have uh, rarely uh, the neoplastic degeneration, but this I think was not the case. Okay, so what is that? Could, yeah. Okay. Let's start with the same pool as before. Okay. Yeah. The sure. first branchial clepsis, second branchial clepsis is a small venolymphatic malformation or another tyroglossal dot cyst. So same question as before. Think about you know the what I um, described and try to uh, think uh, um, what's what can be. Okay, very interesting. So most of you say second branchial clepsis. This was a pitfall. Okay. Some of you say first branchial clepsis. So I told you location, location, location is very important. So you need to know where the cyst, the, the first branchial apparatus anomaly, the second branchial apparatus anomaly are expected and where the tyroglossal duct cyst is expected. So this was another tyroglossal duct cyst. Why? Because they are median. Again, what we read in the book is median, but they could be also paramedian. And these things was confirmed uh, on pathology as um, uh, um, tyroglossal duct cyst. Uh, the second and first branchial cleft anomaly will never be there, but all the tyroglossal duct cysts have this very close relationship with the strap muscle. So remember, this is from Ansberger. They say it could be paramedian, especially in the infraoid neck. Remember the, the course, and actually I put in my YouTube channel a short lecture that I did for the European course of neuroradiology on the embryology of the neck. It's a practical embryology, just to help you to realize where the lesion are from is 20 minutes. And I think once you read it, you see this, and because I studied for that, I didn't know all these things. I studied for this presentation and, and a lot of things become clear. Speaking about midline cysts, you need to know element of differential diagnosis. This is a, a slight courtesy from Kali Robson, who is the pediatric neurologist, one of the pediatric neurologists at Boston Children. Look at this cyst. Posterior third of the tongue, anterior third of the tongue or tubular, and this is down the tongue, but with restriction. So this is a vallecular cyst. Vallecular cyst is very similar to the some location of tyroglossal duct cyst up in the, in the base of the tongue, but is in the base of the tongue, so it's posterior. If you see a cyst in the tongue that is in the anterior third of the tongue here, or rarely can be serpiginous, think of forgot duplication cyst. Very, very important differential uh, because also the menagerie, surgical menagerie is a bit different. If you see a cyst that show restriction, call it, uh, well, I would call it epidermoid slash dermoid cyst because the, they can be very similar. It's not true that restriction is only dermoid. 
and also pathologically, it doesn't make much sense to distinguish the two. So I, I report epidermoid slash dermoid cyst. But this difference, posterior tongue, anterior tongue, valecular, or teraglossal depth cyst, and for a growth application is very, very important. So remember, location, 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 teraglossal depth cyst is uh, between the foramen cecum and the aoid bone, valecular cyst in the valecula, and they are both posterior in the tongue when the teraglossal duct cysts happen in the tongue, as you saw, can be also uh, down the neck. Uh, but foregut duplication cyst is in the one third of the tongue or serpiginous. So remember this location for the differential. And this is a beautiful paper from the group in Boston, where they say foregut duplication cyst of the head and neck, although uncommon, should be included in the differential diagnosis of cystic head and neck lesion. And remember, where is the valecula here and where is the foramen cecum? Sometimes you cannot really distinguish when the cyst is big. Now, there is another cyst exactly like the same, the other one in terms of signal. Just there is a bit of tract here and is in a different location. So what's that? Is the first branchial cleft anomaly, second branchial cleft anomaly, venon lymphatic malformation, or a lateral tyroglossal duct cyst. Think where, where is the lesion. Again, if I'm going too fast, I'll just chat and say, sorry, go slower. Okay, so most of you say first branchial cleft uh, anomaly. Uh, the, the correct terms now is branchial apparatus anomaly. Uh, some of you say second branchial apparatus anomaly, 25%. No one say tyroglossal duct cyst, very well. Uh, just 1% say venal lymphatic malformation, very well. So this is a first branchial cleft. Branchial apparatus anomaly are first, second, third, and four. Most of these are second branchial uh, cleft. So you need to uh, diagnose, know how to diagnose the second branchial apparatus anomaly. The rest, eh, you, can, you can live without, they are very rare. But the first branchial apparatus anomaly can be either inferiorly to the auricle or like the case I showed before along the lateral margin of the parotid. So even if you don't see a tract that we could see in that case, remember the, 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 this, you know, the, the embryological course, and you will have the diagnosis. The radiological characteristic in case of cyst do not help you. And this is the one below the auricles that I took from SlideShare because we didn't have a case at Gosh. This is another case, a cyst, CT appearance is still a cyst, no enhancement, nothing. Now, my question for you is, and you can use the chat if you want, or Ali can do the diagnosis. What are the three anatomical bundles of the lesion? One, two, and three. What are these anatomical bundles? Uh, feel free to use the QA session just to write, or Ali, you can say something if you want. Okay, so in the medial aspect i see the carotid and the internal jugular vein yeah so that's a carotid space indeed carotid space and posteriorly i can see the sternocleidomastoid muscle i guess Very good anatomy and anteriorly is that the submandibular gland correct exactly okay. what should be so basically you have done because location 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 is like the real estate market when it comes to cyst uh, uh, that differential diagnosis in the neck. Uh, location is everything. So you have done the diagnosis because uh, our um, point of interest, the flat we want to buy is exactly when where we want it to be between the submandibular gland, carotid space and, and sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this is um, a second branchial cleft anomaly, typical location. Now look at this other case. This is an MRI. Again, the cysts look exactly like the other. Look at this, think where is located this lesion and how we are going to do the differential diagnosis. So look at this, where it's located and try to do the diagnosis. Are there three seconds? What is the diagnosis? First, branchial apparatus anomalies, second branchial apparatus anomalies, venal lymphatic malformation or a tyroglossal duct cyst. Very, very good. Again, every one of you got it right because Ali described precisely the location, which is between the subandibular gland, carotid space, and sternocleidomastoid. Uh, is at the level of the anterior middle to the uh, uh, superior third of the sternocleidomastoid. So that's very, very important. Now, 
We know how to do the Desmond Sango Branger clap normally, we are done. The other are very rare, but still I want to show you. This came as lymphatic malformation, but this is in this fatty space that is the posterior cervical space with a tract going there. Uh, so we reported this as a third branchial apparatus anomaly because the book said that when it's in the posterior cervical space, we call it the uh, third branchial apparatus anomaly. This is controversial. So, the, you know, uh, I don't have the histological diagnosis, but this is how I reported because this is how, this is from Bernard and Koch. This is this call, you see, fat posterior cervical space, third branchial cleft anomaly. So is below and is medially to the middle third of the sternocleidomastoid. Okay, and this was also, you know, on the right hand side. Anyway, I will come back to that. But as a general rule, if you call it a uh, third branchial cleft uh, uh, anomaly or apparatus anomaly e uh, assist in the posterior space, you are uh, um, correct. Look at this other thing. The arrows are, point, are pointing to two structures on the normal side. This is on the left, there is a tract connecting these two, uh, this two structures. Now, think about what these two uh, structures, what they are. You can use the, the chart or Ali can do a brilliant diagnosis. So what is that structure? That's the thyroid so, gland. It's yes, fun. correct. Yeah, yeah. This is exactly the thyroid gland. And what is this structure full of hair here? A bit probably I didn't give you the best thing, but this is <laughs> pyriform sinus. So on the other side, we oh, have yeah. a tract connecting the pyriform sinus to the, um, uh, the thyroid lobe. And this is what we call four branchial cleft anomaly that is not a cyst, it's just a tract. And this is a case from literature, again, from Bernard and Koch. And you can see that they gave contus barium and there is this tract connecting the thyroid to the pyriform sinus. And both are on the left. Now, it's all about location, 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 but it's all also about embryology. And I want to show you something. I mean, this is a simple lecture just to guide you uh, through the differential diagnosis, but things can be a bit more complicated. This is an amazing page of, uh, paper from Bijoy Thomas. Um, and uh, Bijoy also has a YouTube channel for 10 minutes differential diagnosis. He does mainly adults now, but this is when he was in Toronto where Ali and me were uh, just 10 years earlier. And they described this, uh, what they reported as third and fourth branchial apparatus anomaly and none of these follow the classic theoretic pathway of the third and fourth arch remnant. So probably the embryologists say these things are from the embryonal thymopharyngeal duct of the third branchial pouch. Again, if you want to know what branchial pouch is, arch, fourth arch are, just look at this short YouTube video on the embryology and everything will be clear. But it's just to say that there are some controversies. And sometimes we study, 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 but then what people have been reporting on literature for years and years may be not correct. So keep an open mind. Anyway, for your report, if you if you call it third branchial apparatus or fourth branchial apparatus anomaly with the location I told you, uh, you, you don't, you know, you, you are not wrong. One thing is very important, guys, is that they are often on the left and the so-called fourth branchial apparatus uh, present with infection. So sometimes you have soft tissue. I forgot to add the case, but I have a case of soft tissue uh, in this location with a small tract barely visible. So you can call it a tumor, you can call it an infection, but actually look for the tract whenever you see on the left side of a young child, um, a soft inflammation uh, going on between the piriform sinus and the, um, um, the thyroid lobe. Very, very important. Now, other few cases uh, uh, and in the next 10 minutes. Uh, so this is a large mass, again, location. Where is it? Everywhere, transpatial location. What are these things here? Look at the different intensity, a bit different from before, okay? So what's the diagnosis? Very, very easy. First branchial, se second branchial cleft anomaly, venom lymphatic malformation or lymphatic malformation because there is not much different a bit of, uh, apart from a bit of contrast in the venous malformation or a thyrogostal duct No one believes in the thyrogostal duct anymore. You saw the fruitful level, transpatial, this is a venolymphatic malformation. 
very, very easy. Why? Because the radiological hallmark of the venous lymphatic malformation are fluid fluid level. Most of you know that. What about this other transpatial cystic lesion? Look at that. Uh, can you see uh, where it goes? You got sub yeah, subcutaneous soft tissue along the temporalis, in the orbit, uh, masticator space, uh, the, the, the um, um, pterygoid fossa. So same question though, another transpatial cystic, but very different from before. Is this a first branchial craft cyst, a second branchial craft cyst, venal lymphatic malformation, or teroglossal duct cyst? Or something else, maybe I... Felicia, we forgot to disclose uh, a heavy Turkish accent and a heavy Italian accent, right? Oh, yes. What <laughs> I, I thought that I speak like someone from Kent. What are you speaking about? <laughs> but, oh you, know, you know, I prefer Italian accent to British accent. It's easier for me to understand. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, try to go to Birmingham. All right. Uh, Yes, venal lymphatic malformation, 95%. Why? Because venal lymphatic malformation can be macro and microcystic. So again, remember the, also that they, you know, they are treated with sclerotherapy and they can change over time and become microcystic. So it's very, very important. Uh, can be rarely unilocalated, but most of the time multilocalated, non-enhancing, cystic and mass, transpatial, fluid, fluid level. So this is the radiological hallmarks. And if you have, this to answer the, the, the question that often I receive, combine elements of venal malformation, lymphatic malformation, so a bit of context enhancement, think of venal lymphatic malformation, doesn't change much in the menagerie. So again, lymphatic malformation, macro and microcystic, hemorrhagic fluid fluid level. Uh, let me show you this other fluid fluid level. So tell me, what is the uh, diagnosis? Uh, so. Uh, Really, guys, I think you can chart it. Um, so this is another fluid fluid level, another mass in the um, in the um, uh, head and neck region. But in this case, it's just one cyst only. So think if you know what this can be. Uh, Ali, do you want to comment a bit on that? Where, where location? Look, oh, someone is chatting. Good. Yeah, we have an answer from. People A K K and I, I don't know what is. What is A K K, Shukriya? Can you can you type it like openly? Mucosil for the location, I think, because it's in the sinuses, they call it yeah. a mucosil. Yeah. Uh, but there is definitely a fluid fluid level yeah. because it's T too dark. I think it could be hemorrhagic. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. So mucosil location is fine for mucosil, but fluid fluid levels. Not oh, fluid. aneurysmal bone cyst. Well, that's interesting. Uh, two people say an animal bone cyst. Well, it's again location, location, location. So look at the CT. This is not transpatial. This is centered in the bone. So it's just to show, and uh, you know, uh, Sucrie and uh, Gokalp, they got it right. Very good. This is an aneurysmal bone cyst. Remember, the fluid fluid level is the radiological hallmarks of the lymphatic malformation and aneurysmal bone cyst. So if something is centered in the bone, think aneurysmal bone cyst. Transpatial in the neck, easy diagnosis. Everyone got it right, lymphatic malformation. Now, uh, this is very, very easy. Again, a uh, big mass with a lot of cyst, but also solid component. This is a post-contest fat sat. This is a T2 fat sat. And uh, uh, how you describe this? Is this a dermoid, a teratoma, hairy polyp, or sarcoma? It's quite big, it's a neonate congenital mass. Remember the age is very, very important together with location. And in this case, it's solidocystic, so you need to use also the appearances. Okay, so 70% say teratoma. Some of you say the sarcoma or dermoid. I told you sarcoma, you, you can have, you know, uh, a congenital sarcoma, but a solidocystic mass uh, in a neonate is most likely to be a teratoma. Now, the important thing is that you need, again, technical knowledge of the difference between head and neck radiology and brain radiology or body radiology. You need the non-fat saturated T1 pre, because when you see fat, and this is an easy case, but sometimes the, when the C star a lot, you can think that this is a lymphatic malformation. We had some cases of lymphatic malformation, uh, what we call lymphatic malformation, and then develop some solid 
um, um, areas very fast, but the clue was in the fat. So remember, look for the T1 spontaneous hyperintensity of the fat, okay? And this is, you know, remember that these are emergency because, radio, uh, you know, th th there is a displacement and compression of the eyeways. So teratoma, anterior neck, off midline, there is fat. You can have the main differential is lymphatic malformation. Goiter is also differential because they may arise from the thyroid gland. But most of the time, we had just one case of, of, of teratoma in the orbit that simulated lymphatic malformation because it was mainly cystic. But if you see a lot of solid part, think teratoma first and look for the fat. This is the last case for today. This is another emergency because there is a stenosis of the airways. And look at this mass. So think what, how would this look like? So there is this hypodense mass with hyperdense center. Okay, so this density here is very peculiar and very similar to the density here of the parapharyngeal region. So this is probably fat. Uh, but look at this structure, and uh, uh, this is how it looked like. So it was operated. Look at the fat and the central stalk of fibrosis. So again, what is your diagnosis and why? It's a dermoid because of the fat. It's a teratoma because of the fat. And despite we don't see it, it's, you know, um, maybe it's a, it's a more mature teratoma. It's an iry polyp, so it's a polyp that develop in the in, in infant, or this is a, a sarcoma that does not show the aggressiveness that we expect. So remember, lesion in the nasopharynx, mainly fat, but with some hyperdensity in, um, in it. Okay, most that's very interesting. So 44% say dermoid, because when we see a fat lesion in the, in the, in the head and neck region, we think dermoid. 20% say teratoma, because as I showed before, there is teratoma, but this thing in the middle may be a soil aspect. 35%, so close call with dermoid, say airy polyp, and no one believed the sarcoma. That's uh, very good, because these are ben benign lesion. So this was called a dermoid from some people, a teratoma from either. People, but it's actually an airy polyp. This is pathognomonic appearance of the airy polyp. is a polyp made of fat with a stalk of fibrous tissue in the middle. So you know your histopathology and you will um, connect uh, with your uh, radiological appearance. And most of them, not all of them, they arise from the Eustachian tube, but they are typical lesion in the nasopharynx. And look again, fat, 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 and the fibrovascular stalk. So my pearl is no histology, you will guess your diagnosis. So this is a pathognomonic appearance. So the tips of the day is that you think cystic and when it's cystic, you go for location or solid. So it, the first thing you ask yourself is cystic or solid or mixed. If it's cystic, you think about the location and your embryology. If it's solid, look at the characteristic that are radiological hallmarks. Use the right protocol. T2, you need to get rid of the fat. T1, pre, without fat suppression, post with fat suppression, because if you have a tumor, it will enhance, and you don't want the confusion with the brightness of the fat. Uh, keep looking, and if you have a problem, ask a friend. There are a lot of experienced people around, and uh, you know, just just uh, uh, feel free to send an email and and uh, and so on. So I will stop sharing, and I will really happy will be happy to take some question, uh, not in Turkish unless Ali. Sure, I will. I will translate you. Thanks. So we have a question from uh, this is Dr. Zeynep Yazıcı from Bursa, and she is asking if is it necessary to confirm the, the diagnosis of pyriform sinus fistula with an uh, esophagography? Uh, no, no. What normally not. So the problem is that these children are scanned for inflammation. Uh, and uh, the, the point is that uh, this, uh, you know, this was an old case from Bernadette that, you know, it clearly showed the connection. But most of the cases, uh, the pitfall when it comes to so-called from branchial apparatus anomaly is that you have a mass there and, you know, ultrasonographists uh, uh, two days ago called it a tumor. And because of the location, 
of between the piriform triangle and the thyroid, you need to look for the trap. But the MRI is enough, and sometimes the ultrasound is enough. I, we never give barium uh, to be to be fair, but it's important you just just do not say oh, it's just an inflammation because then if we don't treat the the tract, it will recur. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we started the question session, questions and answers. Feel free to ask questions, and we yes. have time. Yeah. Um, another thing, yeah, I want to um, to stress is that uh, it's really some of the in some of the situations we never do MRI. Like thyroglossal duxis is very very unlikely that we do an MRI. But uh, you know, the, the ultrasound is the most important thing that we do um, uh, for for some of them. But in general, I think if you start, you know, with cystic solid and then go from there, it's very very. Uh, easy is much easier than the adult at the neck where you need to track down the, the, the tumor and so on. Uh, there is another question. Yeah, another question from Sarha Takish. Uh, is, uh, does it matter with respect to management, uh, the differentiation between the first and second branchial cleft cyst? Not that I know of. Um, it is uh, um, important sometimes the differentiation with the forego duplication cyst, um, but it's just, uh, yeah, I end up with lymphatic malformation, uh, but uh, be between first and branchial, I don't think they changed the, the management, okay. but it's like some tumor, you know, uh, we, we like to do, the, the, you know, to differentiate that because we understand the embryology. And when we understand the embryology, we understand better differential diagnosis. When we used to, there is a you know a paper that we published uh, just out on AJNR. We try to work out a, a flowchart for differential diagnosis of posterior fossa tumor in children with Cesar Alves uh, uh, in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Doesn't matter. Well, for now, not really. But they start to add a lot of things in the medulloblastoma classification and can change the prognosis and so on and so on. So. The more we try to understand also the embryological controversies, uh, the more we know. And at some point, this may matter. So it's good to do the right diagnosis if you can. But between first and branchial cleft anomaly, I think they treat exactly the same. For a good application, they, they do slightly different operation in comparison to a thyroglossal taxist or molecular cyst. Thank you. I think that was clear. Another question, how can we differentiate multi-compartmental second branchial cleft cyst and lymphangioma without fluid fluid level? Okay, so first of all, we don't call it lymphangioma anymore, we call it lymphatic malformation. That's very important because lymphangioma as name implies that this is a tumor, while venous malformation, lymphatic malformation, uh, AVM, they are malformation, while hemangioma is a tumor. Uh, the mult so, the, the multi-component uh, branchial cleft cyst, it is very rare. You can see a tract, and sometimes you can see a small cyst and tract better, but normally uh, we, we tend to have uh, transpatial lymphatic malformation and, um, and uh, you know, uh, um, single locate, you know, a single cyst or cyst that are tract located in the space they Ali described. Sometimes you have very weird stuff you cannot distinguish, but I mean, I never encountered these, these things. The thing that I encounter, as I said, is teratoma, cystic teratoma versus uh, lymphatic malformation can be very tricky and changes a lot. So yeah, I, I, I will add this case to the presentation next time. Very, very, I cannot because there are, you know, um, there, there is no consensus. Another question by Dr. Oktay Zaim. He is asking, mm -hmm. uh, how, what is the differential diagnosis for the sublingual herniation? Or sublingual herniation? I've never seen a sublingual herniation in my okay. life. Okay. So, uh, I Me don't neither. Know. <laughs> I don't uh, know, maybe if he, if, if he can... Sub, 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 sublingual gland herniation, uh, I think, but I, I've never seen one, so yes. I'm, I'm not... I mean, maybe, I think... Yeah, if he can join us or he can just yeah, explain. Very happy to, I mean, my, so there is the sub, sub, sublingual gland herniation through the uh, myeloid uh, gap, but uh, I, you know, I, 
I don't think this is yeah. so. Yeah. Felice, I started to see lots of ectopic thymus tissue in the neck, and it's sometimes very confusing and sometimes associated with the thymopharyngeal duct cyst. Yeah. So, look, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, you, but you, you should have this thymus and not thyroid, right? Ectopic thyroid. Yeah, th yeah. Thymus, yeah. So, yeah. So the problem is again is the, the thymus and also the ectopic thyroid, they are solid masses. Okay. They can have some some con both of them some connection because embryologically they derive from that. So the uh -huh. best example is that if you see, you know, the ectopic thyroid is along the course of thyropharyngeal duct, and they can be associated with the duct. So it's very, very tricky to do the differential, but you can say that this is solid, and then there is no real, you know, when you are sure about the, with ultrasound, basically, about the, the, the fact that this is not aggressive tumor, you are more or less okay, and then you follow up, and you see the evolution over time. So the regression, for instance, over time and the, the, thyroid, the ectopic thyroid, they can have a um, hormonal problem and so on. But the important thing is that you, you are not fooled about, you know, that this is a tract with a neoplastic malformation. So you need to check the structure, the ultra structure of the thing. But this is better done than on ultrasound. So when you, you know, you check the, the times and thyroid is better done on ultrasound. So I, I think, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, and they are very uncommon, uh, especially the thyroid. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple, uh, but again, they follow the, the, the thing because if you know the embryology, the thyroid starts to develop from the thyroglossal duct system and then goes down, down. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, they're asking about Ranula, actually. I think he yeah. meant Ranula. Ranula. Yeah, Ranula. Yeah. So, very interesting. The, the diving Ranula is, 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 is basically a, um, uh, like a, a fluid. Uh, uh, Ranal, they open up and they involve the, the, the submandibular space and there has this comet shape. The important thing, and that's a very good question, I didn't have time to show the example, but radiologically you cannot distinguish between ranula and a lymphatic malformation in the sublingual and, and the submandibular space. They look very similar. So my, my, my take is that if I see a fluid fluid level, I call it lymphatic malformation. If I see only cysts, I say favor ranula cannot exclude venial lymphatic malformation. Not sure to be honest with you, What's the difference in terms? I think that if it's a cyst, they, they, they take it out while lymphatic malformation, they, they can use sclerotherapy. I'm not sure it's changed the management, but I'm sure that radiologically without fluid fluid level, very tricky, very tricky differential. Yeah, they look same, okay. yeah. And okay, let me check the questions. There is one more question. So in the adult world, when there is a cyst, we need to consider cystic lymphadenopathies, but is it the same for children? Is it in the differential diagnosis of cystic lesions? Uh, well, no, I never came across, uh, you know, a cystic lymphadenopathy, which is not a necrotic kind of evolution of tumor or sometimes tuberculosis and, and so on. The, the difference with, with when it comes to nodes, is a bit more that people from the adult world, I mean, normally they are not neuroradiologists or endonech radiologists, but they call uh, uh, the nodes that are quite big in children, they call it as mass or something, but you know, remember that the, the nodes in children are a bit enlarged. But this cystic lymphadenopathy, I, I haven't encountered in my practice, at least I, I do only cross-sectional images. So I don't, not sure about the, my the body colleagues, pediatric radiologists. I don't know, Ali, what's your experience about that, but not very frequent for yeah, me. Yeah, I think th there is a difference between children and adults for the lymph nodes. In, for, for in adults, if you see a cystic lymph node, then it's necrotic and it's more likely to be a metastatic lesion. But in children, we see atypical lymph nodes all the time. They they may they may lose their echogenic hyla. They may be rounded. They may be really hypoechoic, or sometimes cystic. Even with a simple infection, it, they don't have to be malignant. So in children, it is different than the adults. They don't have to be lymphoma, you know. But, but the bottom line is, you know, I I I think it, I trust ultrasound, and we should not 
ask too many MRI or things that can be explored in ultrasound MRI is the second step. And this is why I show you the differential that I work on. But, you know, most of, you know, you guys do a lot, you know, most of the job in terms of uh, first, first uh, uh, differential technology. So this is very, very important to know where our expertise stops. And this is why we don't see many teleglossal ducts because we don't image them. They are, they are, oh. um, you know, one thing I wanted to stress uh, again, I didn't have time. When you see a solid cyst, a solid lesion in the skull or skull base, the first things to do with restriction and so on, some people call SCH, some people call rhabdomyosarcoma. The first thing to do, to do an ultrasound of the abdomen, because most likely is in an infant, this is a neuroblastoma metastatic. Uh, uh, in the skull and skull base. So this is something I've, uh, I have in a lot of my lecture. In this, guy, uh, in this case, I didn't put for a question of time, but remember that if you have a solid aggressive lesion in the skull base or skull in an infant, the first thing you ask before biopsy and all this stuff, and it's an ultrasound of the abdomen, because you can save a lot of hassle to the child. So remember, much more frequent than nodal or intracranial metastasis are the skull metastasis from neuroblastoma. Okay, let me read you this question. In the late phase dynamic post-contrast images, do venous malformation enhances completely eventually? So indistinguishable from other solid lesions? No, I, uh, in my experience, they are always patchy uh, because there are always some, these are histologically some large, um, venous lake, so there will be at least some 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 flebolites here and there to create. But normally, when we do the first scan, we check the evolution. No one does just one uh, scan, uh, one one sequence. You know, you just at least need a couple of spin echo. So in my experience, are always unless they are very small, they are always uh, you know enhancing. I've seen some small lesion in the scalp that are enhancing homogeneously, but just because they are small. But again, if you call this hemangioma, you ask before calling hemangioma, you ask your clinician and they say, you know, it's, it's been born with that and, uh, and it's bluish and Valsalva increase. This is your diagnosis. One, actually I have this case from a friend of mine, Lorenzo Pinelli from Blesha, and he's not an head and neck radio apart from the Petrus one. And he say, oh, this is an hemangioma or not. It's just, was just, uh, um, above the, the scalp, but then the description he did was typical of a venous lymphatic malformation worsening over time, or venous malformation worsening over time. So I say, you know, call it venous malformation, uh, and uh, this changed a lot the management. So in general, no, do not, and you know, if you wait a lot for a large lesion, there is no homogeneous enhancement, but if they are small, yes, this is a possible pitfall, uh, but again, uh, clinical appearance is your friend. I'm glad that there, there were a lot of attendees here, really glad. And anyone, anyone else? No other questions? No one asked what we cooked. No, oh, pasta, I told them. Yeah, ah, pasta, right. We macaroni, also... actually, maybe they didn't understand. We call it mac mac macarna. Ah, macar no, Ma yeah. macaron. <laughs> and we painted as well. Next time I will show you one of your painting. I see that. Oh, sure. <laughs> there is one more question, actually. Sure. <laughs> but that was a good, good, good one, actually. My first one, but it was yeah. good. How can we differentiate parathyroid cyst and lymph node located in posterior inferior to thyroid lobes? Yeah. The question is, I don't know because thyroid in uh, they do the the body people, so the this is the limit. I I am not allowed to, so I'm not sure about this. Thing. I don't know if you want to comment Ali on that, but I don't. Uh, we don't do parathyroid in our hospital. Uh, so they are very rare, honestly. Para, in children, parathyroid cysts and in cystic lymph nodes, they are very rare. But cystic lymph nodes are even rarer. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't think it will be possible to differentiate. And it, it's not an important clinical problem, honestly. I never came across this differential myself. Yeah. Most, I... most problem in, in, it was the same in Turkey, same in Canada. Pediatricians are over worried about the lymph nodes in the neck. 
and they send children and for the follow-ups and it's difficult to follow by ultrasound these lymph nodes and sometimes they they ask us to confirm it, this is not a lymphoma or and it's not possible so we just describe all the lymph nodes i just give the largest lymph nodes and tell them that there is no atypical findings even there are atypical findings they can be infectious in children so that's the main problem actually <laughs> yeah yeah Okay, so you see it. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think it's it's 15 minutes. We are over time. So Felice, thank you very much on thank behalf much. of Turkish Society of Pediatric Radiology. And uh, thank you for everyone joining to the lecture and contributing, asking questions. And I, I would like to see you in another conference, Felice. <laughs> yeah, sure, Pro possibly live. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. Uh, and uh, have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye.